Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I want to welcome everybody to the Alaska Wellness Summit, Conquering the Opioid Crisis. Uh, as you can see, we have a great turnout, which I'm, uh, we're all very happy about. Uh, I'm Dan Sullivan. I'm going to be your uh, MC today. And um, I'm really, really honored that we're going to begin with the president of the Connect Tribal Council, Mike Tucker, to start us off uh, with an invocation. Mike. On behalf of Connect Tribe, good morning and welcome. Thank you for coming to the Alaska Wellness Summit, Conquering the Opiate Crisis. I'd like to commend Senator Sullivan and his staff for bringing the summit back home so the voice of Alaskans can be heard. You know, as I was thinking about this moment yesterday, I decided the most important thing that I could say is Thank you, Cara Nelson. Thank you, Tierra Walters. Thank you, Christina Love. Thank you, Julie Douglas. Because the four of you had the courage to tell your story at the Unite to Face Addiction Rally in our nation's capital, we are here today. It doesn't stop there, though. We need to thank Senator Sullivan for listening yeah. to their stories. <laughs> but it doesn't stop there, either. Thank you, Dan Sullivan, for taking action. Now, let's conquer the opiate crisis together. <laughs> Would you stand and join me in a prayer? Father, thank you for being just that, our Father. We we're asking that you would be here today in a very powerful way, Lord. This, this problem is bigger than we are, but it's not bigger than you. We need your spirit here today, and we're asking just that, Lord. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, again, I want to welcome everybody, and if you're if you're still coming in to take a seat, please uh, please do so. We got a we still got a lot of room. We have a, a a great turnout here, and I want to thank um, Mike for that nice invocation. Uh, very very important. I'm going to start very quickly just with a couple logistic, logistics items. Um, as we move forward throughout the day, uh, you have a beautiful setting here, of course, but uh, no food or beverages allowed in this beautiful theater except bottled water. Restrooms are down the hall over here when you go out. To the left, um, when you exit the, you'll exit the same theater doors uh, when you leave the theater to pick up lunch. Uh, this, of course, is a non-smoking campus, and you've already heard the xylophone that's going to be our indicator that you have five minutes to move in and out of different breaks and meetings. So a little bit on the logistics. Um, I also, uh, any kind of conference like this, you need uh, to make sure there's a lot of thank yous. And I know I'm going to miss folks, but a lot of people came together to put this event together today. We have very uh, numerous generous sponsors who I want to do a shout out to, the Alaska Mental Health Trust Authority, Cook Inlet Tribal Council, Matsu Health Foundation, 
uh, Rasmussen Foundation, State of Alaska, Department of Health and Social Services. Uh, I want a, a special mention to our hosts this morning, Matsu College, this beautiful facility, beautiful campus. <laughs> Unfortunately, Director uh, Talis Kohlberg, who's a good friend of mine, couldn't make it here tonight, but I want to thank him personally for this. Uh, I want to thank a, bi a big shout out, and you're seeing them all over, and if uh, you get the, a chance to say hi to them, our uh, Job Corps members who are guiding you today. Great young Alaskans. And if there's any unruly folks, which there won't be, they're, the Job Corps guys are going to be uh, in here, so they're going to be doing a great job. They're in uniform. You've probably already seen them. Uh, and then I also want to welcome a number of people. You know, we, uh, part, of, part of the importance of this summit is we're, we're having federal officials uh, come. And um, it's a real honor for us. They've had to travel literally thousands of miles. The Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Health and Human Services, Dr. Mary Wakefield's here already, and she's going to be speaking. It's the number two official in the entire HHS for the country. Really, really big deal that she's here. So. The VA, the Veterans Health Administration, Dr. Jennifer Lee, who's the Deputy Undersecretary for Health Policy and Services, and Dr. Karen Drexler. Uh, they're also top officials with the VA coming in from Washington. How about a round of applause for them for already here? Uh, David Dickinson, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administrator. Again, a very important federal official who's going to be with us all day today. Round of applause for him. And then a little bit later, we're going to have the Surgeon General of the United States here, Dr. Vivek Murthy, who's been all over the state already, as uh, the Secretary has. Uh, and he's been, in many ways, leading the charge on trying to address this crisis throughout the country. So it's great to have him as well. And of course, we have many speakers from Alaska, top officials from our state, leaders. And what we're going to try and do uh, is have a little bit of Q&A with all these officials if we have time. So I, again, really, really want to thank um, our wonderful list of speakers here today. So I'm going to begin with a story, and I think some of you have already heard this, but, um, you know, I'm a freshman senator. I've only been in for about a year and a half. You, of course, you come to the Senate with ideas of what you want to do, areas of focus, area of, areas of attention that you've had in your life, experiences. And um, when I came to the Senate, I, I certainly uh, had a lot of those. Um, but last fall, uh, there was a group of women that you will hear from shortly who brought to my attention in a very moving, powerful meeting what we're all here about today, which is the scourge of addiction, the challenges of recovery, the courage it takes to stay on that path that is not only happening in Alaska, but across the country. And as the father of three teenage daughters, and a lot of what's happening in our state and in America is young people, young people, very young people, uh, with these challenges. Uh, this meeting I had was just, uh, it just like opened my eyes and my staff's eyes. And because as everybody here knows, this, this hits everybody. Doesn't matter, rich, poor, rural, urban, what race you are, this is hitting everybody. So since that meeting, I have watched, and my staff and I, we've watched documentaries, we've read countless articles, read books, spoke with uh, many Alaskans about the personal stories facing addiction. In reading the statistics, all of us know what's happening out there. More Americans last year died from overdoses than car crashes for the first time ever in our country. Reading stories here in Alaska, since 2010, the number of heroin-associated overdose deaths have increased more than tenfold. Just in Juneau in 2016, in a six-month period, there were six overdose deaths from heroin in one city in Alaska of 31,000 people. Six. 
in six months. In 2012, Alaska's prescri prescription opioid pain reliever overdose death rates was more than double the national average. So these are the statistics. But as you know, behind every statistic is a real life and a family. So this meeting that I had just opened my eyes and um, helped me and my team, and I want to thank my team. A lot of you have gotten to know the Cates, plural, uh, who did a great job uh, on this, but all of the rest of my team here. But they, they literally, this meeting literally kind of, all of us, oh my gosh, right? So we started to look for ways to help. I went to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, who I happen to have a lot of respect for, and I just went to her and I said, can you help my state? So what do, we want to, what do we want to get done today? What's the point? Well, I believe first and foremost, we're here to educate, learn, listen, and engage, all with the determination to move forward together to conquer the opioid crisis that is impacting our great state and our great country. So take a look at the agenda. We have a very full agenda. If you take a look at it, we're, we're trying to cover a lot of things and a lot, amount of, a lot of time. And I know I'm already over my allotted time, so I apologize for that. But of course, we can't cover everything. So for example, a big part of the solution is public safety and to interdict the supply of drugs coming into Alaska and America. And although we're very focused on coming together. Let's not be naive. There's a lot of bad guys out there who are involved in this. So although we're not going to focus on that so much today, you will note throughout the audience, we have the top, the head of the FBI for Alaska here, the head of the DEA here, troopers, first responders, local police, fire department, who are literally on the front lines of this. And if you see them today, and maybe we should do it right now, we should give them a big round of applause. <laughs> Second, what we want to accomplish is given the number of high-level federal officials here, we certainly want to paint for them a picture of Alaska. What a great state we are, but the unique challenges faced by many Alaskans distance, access, treatment centers. And we want them, of course, to keep that in mind when they're writing regulations and awarding grants. So, but I do want to thank them again for coming because it really has made this a very, very important meeting for all of us. Third, we want Alaskans who are struggling with this crisis, whether parents or family members or people who are actually struggling with addiction to know that they are not alone. As I've read up on this challenge and problem, it's very clear that so many continue to suffer in silence, afraid to, to open up and speak because of the stigma associated with addiction. We hope today's summit will encourage more families to seek help and to gain courage to be open and talk about this. And fourth and finally, we want to provide for our state a sense of hope for those struggling with addiction and their families. And that's probably the most important thing we're trying to do today. Which brings me back to the Alaska women who inspired this summit. Kara, Christina, Julie, Kim, Teria, I'd like you to please join me on stage. <laughs> Their stories that I heard that you're going to hear right now are the stories of Alaska's mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, loved ones. You will see, as I did, they represent courage, recovery, struggle, yes, but most of all, uh, they represent hope. So again, how about a round of applause for these women?
Kara, over to you. Hello. Hello, Alaska. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. And thank you, Senator Sullivan, for not only meeting with us on October 5th of last year, but really carrying this CARA bill that has really um, changed our lives together and the, our nation. And so um, I'm a woman in long-term recovery, and what that means to me is I have not used a drink or a drug since June 1st, 2011. Thank you. What that also means is that I get to be the mother that my children always deserve, that I get to live this gift of recovery in everything I do, that I took so much from my community and active addiction, but today I give back every single day. And recovery is possible. We do recover. Um, I'm also the director of Haven House Juno, which is a, a recovery residence for women coming home to their community after incarceration. And what that looks like is just manifesting this recovery supports in our communities because we are obviously lacking, but there is hope. And we're all here to bring that hope because there's thousands of Alaskans right now in long-term recovery who haven't spoken out because of the stigma and the shame. And that's what keeps us dying. When we can't speak out, when we started Haven House and we had to really advocate to say, you know what, this is what long-term recovery looks like and we're beautiful people and this is a gift. We live the tragedies every single day. We live the tragedies, we see the tragedies. There's probably not one person in this room today that has not been affected by addiction in one way, shape, or form. There's not one person in this room that also couldn't be affected by long-term recovery. And I'm here to tell you that there is hope and we do recover. On October 4th, we, um, we, we stood with tens of thousands of people advocating and family members and people that lost family members in one on the National Mall. And I'm telling you something right now, it changed our lives. And that was the day that the silence ended across the nation. And today, Alaska, the silence needs to end in our state because we have to do this together. We are a community. We are coming together, collaborating, and we're never going to stop. We will get well, and we need all of you. All of us have to do this together. We have to come together. There is hope. And I'm going to turn it over to my sister, Christina. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Oh, God. God is so good. So, so, so good. Yeah, this is an incredible experience because I'm one of the lucky ones. I'm blessed, I'm favored, and I don't know why, but it doesn't really matter. Um, I come from two long lines of um, generations of, of abuse, addiction, and suicide. My mother has autism, and my father is a convicted pedophile. Um, but despite those two things, I had a really wonderful childhood. You know, I, I grew up in Chitna, Alaska. I was born in Fairbanks. And um, the whole bootstrap mentality, work hard and anything is possible. And I did really well in school. And I went on to, um, to, to graduate and, and travel the world and um, live in foreign countries. And I, I just, I thought that I, I could run from things. And addiction was one of the things that I couldn't. And I spent so much time being ashamed of those. It's an absolute testimony to the power of recovery that I can stand here and I can talk about those things. There was this really incredible moment um, growing up. Um, growing up in a rural town is really hard, but it's especially hard when my father's indictment was posted on the front page. And I remember children in school asking me if I had been molested and making fun of me. And I'll never forget that. But really powerful was my best friend at the time. And we'd known each other since, um, since kindergarten. And she asked me if, if anything was wrong. You know, and, and I was so upset that she'd asked me um, if anything had happened because it wasn't something that I wanted to talk about and it wasn't something that I talked about for years and years and years and it's incredible that I can stand in front of all of you today without shame or guilt and talk about the things that I've lived through um, that that my trauma was a causation and correlation to to my addiction that my disease continued to be a catalyst for discrimination and physical and sexual abuse. It's absolutely incredible that I'm still alive. I've been sexually assaulted more times than I can remember. I've overdosed more times than I can remember. I've been in and out of the ER. I've tried to commit suicide several times because I couldn't escape the pain. And it's, it's, the good news is that, that those generations ends with me. That door is closed. I'm a whole new generation. <laughs> yes. 
I'm a recovery carrier, and I, I get to bring hope. If somebody would have told me years ago that I would end up in a crack house, that I would that I would be selling my body, that I would be intravenously using multiple drugs, that I would be homeless, living on the street, I would have said they were absolutely crazy. I had a degree. I had I had a, a beautiful life, you know, and I lost all of those things. And if somebody also told me that I would be a civil and disability rights activist, that I would be a supporter for, for people in recovery, that I would be there in people's darkest hour to, to free them from the chains that bond me, I would have also said that they were crazy. If they told me that I would be standing on stage right now telling my life story and bringing hope, I wouldn't have believed them. This is an absolute beautiful, beautiful experience. And I just thank you so much for, for having an open mind and an open heart and giving us the opportunity to, to be vulnerable and share with you, our experience, our strength, and, and our hope. And um, this is just a really, really exciting time. I'm, it's, it's just absolutely incredible. I remember waking up from my, um, um, in detox, and I didn't know what, what year it was. And, you know, just, just wanting a solution and not knowing how to get there. And it, it's incredible that that, that that time has arrived, that things have come full circle. And so like my friend John Schinholzer says, let's make history. First of all, thank you guys for all being here. And excuse me for reading, I'm not as a seasoned speaker as these heroes. <laughs> um, I'd like to talk about what led me to meeting Senator Sullivan and what happened since then. 17 months ago, on, in March of 2015, I opened our local newspaper and I was shook to the core. A picture of a beautiful young girl laying dead on her bedroom floor. Her name is Summer Myers. She had died from a heroin overdose. Her mother, Jackie Smallwood, wanted our nation to see the reality of a silent epidemic. I'm a very active person in my community, except no one knew that I had an ugly secret that I'm the mother of a long-term heroin addict. I had learned early about the bad stigma that our nation has attached to addiction and the parents of addicts. The bad stigma also contributes to the epidemic that our nation is facing. Living with the fears that I rehearse often of the police walking up my sidewalk to knock on my door to tell me that my daughter has overdosed is paralyzing. So I found Jackie Smallwood, the woman who posted the article on Facebook, and I private messaged her and asked if we could meet. A few other people had done that also. We formed a group and I finally, after 15 years of dealing with this torment alone, I was talking with other people who understood me and wanted change also. My daughter at the age of 19 went to a doctor for a backache and she left with enough opiates and benzos to kill a horse. I still can't believe doctors were legally allowed to do that. It didn't take long for her addiction to turn to heroin and for her to lose everything, including custody of my grandchildren. That was the most heartbreaking moment of my life. We have gone from me supervising visitation to no visitation. I'm proud to say, though, that my grandchildren are now in ninth and 11th grade, and they're beautiful, smart young ladies. So the group that we formed has now turned into over 500 member nonprofit we advocate for change in the way addiction is handled in our state. We have a debilitating epidemic in our state. Not one city, town, or village is untouched. The CARA Act is a huge step in the right direction for saving lives and putting families back intact. The board of my um, nonprofit, it's called Real About Addiction, on purpose is full of recovering addicts because they know more about this than I do. They're teaching me every day. They're very smart, heroic people. I'm very proud of recovering addicts. I think they're the bravest people on the face of this earth. We care about addicts. We want them to be recovering addicts. I don't have any educational background in addiction or recovery. I do have love and compassion that I can give along with respect and support. With the help of the CARA Act, addicts have the opportunity to have the tools that they need for a new life. When an addict wants to be clean, 
giving them a lifeline is the first step that we can do. They have to hold on to that lifeline and work hard for their recovery. But I have to say that every time that my daughter had come to me, for those few times that she did begging and crying and pleading for help, I couldn't find it. That was the heartbreaking moments that I, I can't get past that until it's fixed. It needs to be fixed. My heroes are the people that have made the CARA Act happen. The legislators, the co-sponsors, the people who voted for it, and who are going to implement it into law. Ag addicts can't recover alone. People like me and our organization can't help addicts recover ourselves. We all need each other. Thank you very much for listening, and thanks for being here. Here's Julie. Hi, my name is Julie, and I'm in long-term recovery. What that means is I have not drank for two years. <laughs> Drinking was my this is on, drug, drug of choice, and um, I had just started at Haven House, I'm the house mom there, a month before we went to DC. And I really didn't know what peer support was, I was just kind of the house mom and I kind of did, I didn't really interact with the girls like I do now, I've learned. Um, but what I want to tell you about is one of the girls that's not here that had a profound impact on my life and watching her, she, when we were at the rally, she saw the signs and it really hit home that that could be her. That could be her mother holding that sign. That could be her daughter holding that sign. And that really got her, her thinking. And, you know, a couple days later, she came back and she said, well, I need to talk to my daughter now. I need to have a conversation because she walked in the room when they revived me and brought me back to life. And she was only 9 or 10. And she was afraid to have that conversation. Well... When we got back, she did have that conversation. She was 20 years younger and 100 pounds lighter. She was a changed person. Going to D.C. changed their family's life forever. It changed my life forever. I used to hear, there's a saying in, in Alcoholics Anonymous about being a grateful alcoholic, and I used to just, what are you grateful for? I have a huge mess I need to clean up. I can never drink again, and I really like drinking, <laughs> so what are we grateful for? But after walking through that with, with Delia, I, I learned watching the miracles that I am grateful now to be here, to be alive, to be sober. Thank you very much. My name is Teria Walters, and I am a community member here in the Matsu Valley. Um, what led me to go to D.C. was... Kara contacted me. I never met this woman in my entire life. Um, but um, what started it all was that I had, my personal story was that I have uh, been affected by addiction since I was a little kid, since I can remember. Um, I started using drugs and drinking with my parents. Um, and then it just progressed. I got, became a ward of the state at 11 years old and um, all I knew was chaos. I bounced around, eventually group homes, juvenile hall, and I had that institutionalized mentality where people were raising me all the way up until my adult years. Um, in 2005, I desperately wanted to get clean. Well, it was actually 2004. And my, my addiction to opiates started with a prescription from a doctor. And it just progressed into heroin use and then abusing opiate or methadone and so on and so forth. Um, eventually, I ended up getting arrested because I started using meth to get off the heroin. And within eight months, I was arrested for two manufacturing charges. And again, here I am, age 14, my first prison sentence. And then I'm getting sentenced to 20 years for manufacturing and having my teenage son in that dwelling and allowing him to use drugs with me. So what my parents did with me, I turned around and did with my own child. Um, I didn't know how to live normal. Um, when I went to prison, I finally had come to my end and when the judge said 20 years, I just couldn't believe that I had come to that point and I was just done. Got out and I've been sober since April 2nd, 2005.
I ended up meeting these ladies in D.C. actually. We talked online and then we just met in D.C. and just in one hotel room, two beds, eight women. It was insane. <laughs> but here I am and, and I just, it pushed me even further because uh, my son also suffered with addiction issues and in Jan June 22nd, 2015, I got that knock that my son had been shot and killed and murdered and left in his car. And so it has personally affected me in many ways since I was a young child. And it has been my mission. Here I am, I have two stigmas on me. I'm a convicted felon and I'm an addict. And living with that and having the institutionalized mentality has driven me to also invest in those lives that are in the same position as me. I deal with a lot of, I started my own ministry, it's called Fallen Up Ministries, and I work with whatever I can. I have Damascus House, and I house people coming out of prison, and I deal with the individuals that nobody else wants to deal with, and that is gang members and people that have been in the system since they were children. And they're in their, here they are in their 40s and 30s, and I am doing my best to um, invest in their lives because it's possible, and get a lot of pushback, but I still keep moving forward, and I don't give up, and I'm standing on this stage today because I have, I serve a mighty God, right. Right. and I give glory to him for where I am today, and I'm standing up here because I am not going to allow my son's murder to be in vain. I want to honor my child by continuing doing what I've been doing even while he watched me and he got to see the last 10 years of his life, his mother actually be a mother to him. So, again, I want to sum it up with it's all about hope. We do have hope. Addicts do have hope. And I think that it's going to take everybody, professionals and people that have life experience to come together to combat this. And uh, I just want to say thank you and thank you for coming out and listening to us and for showing up. Thank you, Teria. I just want to give a shout out to the ladies who aren't here today, Samantha Garten, Jennifer McAllister, and Delia Williams, because those ladies really knocked out the meeting we had with the senator here, and there was not a dry eye in the house. They were all affected. Their lives were affected greatly. And so I, they're in Juneau today. They weren't able to make it. So I just wanted to give them a shout out there. Thanks. Okay, do you see what I mean? Aren't you inspired? Beautiful, strong, courageous, smart. Um, these are the women responsible not only for the summit, but uh, the CARA bill, which they were talking about, we're gonna talk about a little bit later, that was what they were doing and everybody else was on the Hill advocating for the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, uh, which I ended up co-sponsoring because they told me to. Right, right. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> and uh, the good news is that passed the Senate, passed the House, and President Obama signed it last week. Okay, so we have time for uh, just one question. Uh, I wanna, we're trying to make sure we have a, a good interaction uh, be, uh, with our speakers. So if anyone, we're just gonna do this informally. I think we have roving mics out there. If anyone has a question, just raise your hand and I'll, I'll try and call. But uh, this is a great opportunity. These women have some uh, very incredible, searing, life experiences, but uh, they, they represent hope. And uh, as you can see, they're not afraid to share, which takes a lot of courage. Any, any questions? Hi, my name is uh, Mi Jung. And um, I'm so proud of all the you ladies are. Um, I just wanted to talk about, um, and also ask about Victims of brain injury and addiction that can affect people medically, physically, and spiritually. And um, 
I am a victim also of all that was mentioned. And also I have brain injury, um, twofold. So I just wanted to say that, do you guys work with, with ladies with brain injury? Yes, <clears throat> absolutely. So I'm the Disability Abuse Response Team Coordinator for Juneau, Alaska. Okay. And kind of the rule in recovery is that um, for mentors that you never work harder than the person you're working with. But that <laughs> hasn't been the rule with people that have traumatic, um, traumatic brain injuries, um, FASD and other debilitating um, diseases and right. um, conditions. And so, um, yeah, we absolutely, we have, we have a couple of different services that we provide and we, and we try to pair people up um, with that have similar experience as well as wraparound services. Okay. Well, I'd like to speak to you afterwards. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else on that question? Yes. Well, let's uh, give one more round of applause for very important women. Everybody smile. Okay, next we're going to take a look at opioid abuse treatment in Alaska. Cook Inlet Tribal Council runs one of the two detox centers in the whole state of Alaska. But it's only two, and that's a challenge. So I'm very honored to have uh, one of Alaska's great leaders, Gloria O'Neill, who serves as the president and CEO of Cook Inlet Tribal Council. I think, I think uh, in this room, she needs very little introduction. She's got a really long bio of incredible, impressive accomplishments. And as opposed to me reading the bio, because she's also very humble. Uh, I, I don't want to take up any more time, so how about a warm welcome for Gloria O'Neill. Wow, it's so amazing to be here this morning. First of all, I want to thank Senator Sullivan and his efforts in taking on this issue that's plaguing our communities. I also want to acknowledge and thank Senator Lisa Murkowski, he's al who's also here with us today. She's been a great supporter of CITC in all of our efforts in this area. I want to thank uh, Dr. Mary Wakefield, who's here, that you'll hear, uh, you'll hear from her uh, later today. Um, but she is one of these individuals in the, the federal system who, I don't want to call her a bureaucrat, because she's much more than that, um, who's a can-do person. And I had the opportunity to meet with her yesterday, and she said, okay, what's your list? We have, what, four or five months left, and we are working hard every day. So I'm really hopeful that you will hear throughout the day um, some of those items that could be on the list that within your role and responsibility, you can help us remove barriers so that we can provide the services and respond to community need. And also want to thank the CITC family. You're out there today. Yeah. I love it. You guys got my back. Yeah. Anyway, I just have a, a quick presentation. I want to stay on time. Um, and just tell you a little story of CITC to begin with. So Cook Inlet Tribal is all about connecting people to their potential, and we do that through partnership. We have four main areas of investment, recovery services, child and family services, working with families and individuals who are in crisis, or who are uh, dealing with the Office of Children's Services and where we can help those families stay intact. We also run one of the largest employment training centers in the state, connecting 
people to unsubsidized jobs across all indi industries in the state every year um, as, as they seek self-sufficiency for themselves and their families. And we have a high priority in investment in education, th believing education is the greatest equalizer of all. And the reason why I tell you a bit more broadly about CITC, because we are about the whole family. When we do our work, we not only think about the whole family, but the whole person. So you could say that uh, we are cradle to grave. Um, we also do our work uh, with a deep uh, set of values that we think about every day when making program decisions, when working with our participants. We're inter interdependent. We know we need one another to not only survive, but to thrive. And that's why it's so great to be here today, because we need our partners to do this work. We also know that we're resilient. You heard an incredible story of resiliency here, that in the face of challenge, we overcome. When we fall down, we get back up and continue to move forward. That we're accountable. We're an organization where we make mistakes. Sometimes things aren't perfect, but we take responsibility uh, for that and move forward. And that in everything that we do, we're respectful. So CITC for about 33 years has had a huge investment in recovery support services. And, and we all know this slide. Uh, this is why we do the work that we do. This is why we make the investment in recovery services. We know that the demand is huge in our community and we've had far too resources for, for a long, long time. We also um, are in a very uh, complex um, field where there's changing regulations, not only from the state perspective, but also federal perspective. And we have to stay ahead of that to keep our doors open and provide the, provide the needed services. In addition to that, staffing has always been an issue within our recovery services area. Lack of uh, adequate staffing and also lack of qualified staffing. So CITC is really trying to figure out how we are innovative, how can we uh, create solutions to respond to these complex issues. So this is just a, a quick snapshot of CITC, our level of investment recovery support services. Uh, the number of individuals over the last five years that we've served through our detox, as Senator Sullivan said, we're the only detox provider in Anchorage. Can you believe it? The only detox provider in Anchorage. Um, and we serve all Alaskans uh, at the Ernie Turner Center. Um, in, in the other areas of treatment, we really believe, as I said earlier, that it's a comprehensive approach. We look at the whole person. So not only do we provide detox services, we also provide inpatient, outpatient assessment, and peer support. And I love this, this chart because, you know, we, we have huge challenges facing us, but as a community, we really try to provide quality service. And I think this chart really says it all for Ernie Turner Center, where you could see that we have a 66% completion rate compared to a, a, a national average of 46%. Um, uh, yeah. We, we know treatment is only one area uh, and in a very important phase in uh, individuals' recovery. But we also know that we need to connect people to jobs. We need to connect people to housing as they're building their life. And this is really important to CITC, that we put the whole might of our services behind an individual who's on the road to recovery. Um, and as you can see here, that 96% of our assessments that we uh, really focus on intense case management, connecting people to needed services in the community and referral to treatment, um, that 100% of our participants are engaged in employment search. We think that is critical to the road to recovery. And um, that 81% of our participants report an overall life improvement. improvement. Now, I know 
that this is not enough. But I want to show you the picture of what we could do to build upon as a community. And um, CITC, through our values, we really try to embed and infuse our, our cultural sense of, of uh, our lifestyle in everything that we do. And so I am very proud to say that we, we've innovated a bit. And what we have done is we've integrated uh, a village council approach within the Ernie Turner Center. And when you come to the Ernie Turner Center, you're part of our family. We call ourselves family, we're connected, we're family. And that's, I think, very healing on, on the road to recovery. And so what we've really done is we've, um, uh, we, we have created an environment where individuals, where participants, that they take charge of their own recovery. We have a system of a first chief, a second chief, a village council, and um, our staff at the center are there to walk side by side and prevent, uh, provide the professional help to our participants, and it has been very successful. Um, and we, we believe that as we build out these peer groups, that that is really the point of success. You guys see somebody you know? Yeah, this is, this is something we're really proud of. Uh, you know, we've just recently invested in creating alumni groups that it all takes a community, it takes one another to, to, to get well. And we have found that this works in, in such incredible ways in all aspects of one's life. Um, and what we started doing is, guess what? We're hiring our alumni. And it's working, so we're responding to this workforce shortage. In addition to that, they serve as mentors and guides. We are able to create these networks that have been very supportive in helping our participants on their road to recovery. And uh, in the short time that we've really uh, focused on this endeavor, uh, you could see over 1,200 um, individuals have been touched through community events and through the network, and we'll continue to grow that. You have, you have our commitment as CITC that we will continue to focus on expanding the peer network. Um, so what's next? This is a very exciting slide because we're all here to talk about how we expand services and respond to community need. Um, I'm really happy to say that uh, we have been working in the Matsu uh, area with partners and have recently put a few proposals forward. Um, uh, that are being reviewed at this point. We're in partnership with Kinnick and uh, Chickaloon Tribe, our, our partners that, that reside in this area. And um, we want to bring out uh, two Matsu outpatient services, uh, peer support, assessments. And so hopefully you will see CITC and all of our partners starting to create the needed resources to respond to need here in the Matsu within the next few months. All right, and this is the big reveal. Um, and I, I'm gonna ask um, one of my mentors and a woman whose leadership that I greatly admire and uh, the work that she's done in the state has been unparalleled, and that's Katherine Gottlieb, who serves as the president and CEO of SCF. And uh, we get to announce to you today that uh, we have been working on this issue together of how we expand detox and treatment services in our community. Um, we've been talking about it for a number of years. CITC cannot do this alone, we know it. We do not work in isolation, we need partners. And so we recently just uh, completed a transaction where CITC sold the Ernie Turner Center to SCF. And SCF will take up providing detox, being a metal medical provider and CITC will focus on expanding treatment beds to the community and we're able to respond to the complex needs uh, and the changing needs in the community. Glory. <laughs> Gloria, I want to have a conversation with you. What? You did not tell me we're the only detox center 
in oh, Anchorage. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. Before, <laughs> before we talked about this deal, She'll hey, do everybody it. out She's here. She's amazing. You know, um, when you're talking with someone, you need to ask them, wait a minute, are you the only one <laughs> going to do this? And then, and then the staff step up, um, South Central Foundation staff, Dr. Douglas Eby over there, April Kyle stand up, and they say, where's the money going to come from? <laughs> And I look at them and I say, I don't know, Gloria is just like praying <laughs> and um, it's going to fall from heaven, right, Doug? <laughs> yes. And Lee is happy about that, our CFO, and that's exactly how we're doing it. We're praying and God's going to provide us with the money. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and, and everyone who needs detox are going to bang on the door, all Alaskans. And I already heard we can recover. Yes. There is hope. I heard also that we have to invest. Yes. We, you, me, us, investors out there, stand up, all of you. <laughs> so uh, Jeff, Jesse, where is he? Oh, um, he's, yeah. it's high. Yeah. He's right yeah. there. <laughs> and uh, I know Rasmussen's in the room. You know, we're all investing. So I heard God's hand of favor is on Alaska. I heard we do recover. I heard we have hope. And so I'm asking, please step up to the plate with us. We're working together. We're sister nonprofits. We're actually really sisters too, you know, <laughs> in the Lord. And so I just want to invite you, come invest, stand up, step up. Hi, veterans. Thank you for serving. I just <laughs> saw you out here. Can you please stand up? Let's recognize you veterans in the room. Yeah. So thank you, Gloria, for bringing us up here. And um, I know Senator Stel Sullivan is over here saying, you have enough time now. <laughs> Get off this day. So. No, we're going to have time for it. Well, look, I think uh, this is a great announcement. This is very important. Obviously, two great leaders in the state showing uh, the importance of coming together and building partnerships and moving forward. Uh, so this is very, very exciting what they just announced. I want to. That, how about a round of applause for Gloria and Catherine again? Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think we, uh, we have time for one question before she was asking, where's Jeff Jesse? He was uh, literally in the wings going, am I on? I'm like, no, not yet. So, uh, but he's back there, Catherine. So we have time for um, one question for Gloria and Catherine. I know we're not shy. I'm right here. Right in front of you, sir. Okay. Standing up. Oh, okay. There you go. Hi. Great. Sorry. Uh, my name is Megan James. I'm the co chair for the Alaska Forget Me Not Coalition oh. for Service Members, Veterans, and Their Families. And I'm wondering do you track veteran data that goes through uh, for the veterans that go through your treatment programs? And if so, what is the uh, data that comes out of that? That's a great question. Yes, we do track it. And I have Rebecca Ling, our Recovery <laughs> Services Director. And uh, she's standing by to, to answer more of these uh, questions in detail. Rebecca? Hi, yes, we do serve veterans in all, across our continuum. And I do have data. I don't have it readily available, but I could meet with you and get you some data after. And we serve veterans at our uh, clinic here in, out in the Matsu area and also collect data on those services. So, and then you can catch Dr. Douglas Ebian. April Kyle at their workshop this afternoon. Again, thank you, Senator Sullivan, um, Gloria, for inviting me, and um, everybody, invest. <laughs> <laughs>